They return their tithes to that new lay entity that covers the whole of North American Division. And then the committee allocates that tithe to conferences who are faithful to Scripture. And that way, the conferences that go woke will go broke. Very simple. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. So, let's talk about that one more time. Because there's another thing that he mentioned that I heard was what sparked the whole issue with him. If it's your first time here, take a moment and hit that subscribe button below and that like button and that notification bell. And that way, you can find the video when I post a new one. Without any delay, let's get into it. They revealed whether we are willing to live according to our conscience and face loss because we believe in truth. And they revealed whether we are willing to accept the right to mandate on other people actions which go against their conscience or not. And I'm not pointing the finger at anybody here tonight, but I am asking each one of us today to look, take a look at yourself in the mirror tonight and ask where we were in the pandemic. Now, and given what we now know about the official narrative that it was almost all a pack of lies, and it was known to be a pack of lies by those propagating it. And maybe it's a call for humility on each of our parts. And a recognition that um, God help us next time this kind of nonsense comes around. And that we're in this together as brothers and sisters. And whatever the divisions and pains of the past have been, let us work together with our brothers and sisters and say, look, the pandemic is over. And I can forgive you if you, and please would you forgive me. And if I, contribute, if I contribute to it, please forgive me and vice versa, because we are more strong, we are stronger and we are more successful in mission when we are united together. And so we need to think of ways of how we come together and recognize the harms that were caused when people acted on the basis of falsehood against one another. The truth really does matter. The, <clears throat> so what do we do as Adventists? Well, this slide here, there's a slide that will probably get me into more trouble, but I put it up there. And I'm, I'm pretty sure most of us didn't even think about it. When the pandemic started, um, some of my, the members of my church were, and myself included, I was not happy that there was the mandate to close the churches. And I was like, why would people close the churches because of what? Of that? And some people were against it. I don't know what. But um, it, is, it is something to consider. In the future, would the hierarchy, I would say the General Conference of the Seven Islands Church, would they give in give in to the mandate of the government to trample underfoot the conscience of the people? Or would they stand for religious liberty? I don't know. That's a good question to ask. <clears throat> so the first thing is, what can we do as Bible Faith Adventists today? And the first thing I would say is, one option you have is do nothing. And recognize that the next time mandates come along, you're probably going to be thrown under the bus once again. And your livelihood, your career, your job, your mortgage, your home, your business, your marriage, your, your custody battles will be sacrificed by our leaders to preserve their institutions, incomes, and status. That is not an option for any of us here tonight. The second option we have, and I would encourage you to do this, is to actively pray for our church leaders. Start praying for Elder Wilson. As I said last night and the night before, Elder Wilson is a champion for mission in our church. I believe his heart really is in the right place. But it's hard for one man to do something against the sheer inertia of all bad divisions around the world. Pray for our world leaders that they will find the courage, no matter what the mainstream media may pressure them to do, to uphold liberty of conscience and to contend for the faith that has been passed on to us. That's good. You know... Jude chapter, th Jude is only one chapter in it. Yeah. The third verse, Jude chapter one, there's only one chapter. Jude chapter one, verse three says this, Beloved, 
while eagerly preparing to write to you about the salvation we share, I find it necessary to write and appeal to you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. So we are to contend for the faith. If we do not contend for the faith, the faith will be overwhelmed by falsehoods. And so when it, particularly when it comes to our church leaders, um, when we elect church leaders and they work in conferences and unions and divisions, we do not pay them to go and do their job and go, go to their desk, write a few emails, sit in a few meetings, watch the trends that are happening and feel bad about what is happening, but say nothing in the committees, then go home and grumble to their spouse about what is happening. We don't pay our leaders to do that. We pay our leaders, as far as I'm concerned, with the tithes that we return. And I'm thankful we have leaders who do do this. We, we return our tithes so that our leaders in their sphere of influence on the committees where they sit, when appointment decisions are being made, when budgets are being allocated, when, when ethical and philosophical decisions are being made in the conference, I'm hoping and praying that our leaders will contend for the faith that has been passed on to them as well. That they will fight and defend the faith that we have, not just that we have as members, but our leaders will fight for and contend for the faith in their sphere of influence. It is not enough just to go to your office and come home after 40 hours and grumble to your spouse. You're in that office for a reason. Who knows, but you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And I thank the Lord for every leader who does stand up for what is right and true and proper. I would encourage you to pray for our leaders, pray for your conference president here, pray for your union president, that they will have the courage when those hidden moments, when decisions are being made that nobody sees, and there's a lot on the line, that they will have the courage to do the right thing. Pray for your leaders because they have impossible tasks. And when they know that people are praying for them, it gives them courage and it puts wind in the sails of that ship of state so the ship is going in the right direction. So pray for your church leaders. I think on this one, um, that's basically one thing that we forget is our leaders are also sinners. And so they can fall just like we, we can. Remember when Paul and when Peter and John were in prison, when they were in prison because they were preaching Christ? What were the other disciples doing? Praying. Now, it's not that our GC leaders are in prison, but remember, there's an agenda. And they are in constant um, surrounding of wicked people that we probably don't even meet in the day-to-day -day. and when I, in the day to in the, in the day to the basis and when I say wicked I'm actually talking about wicked meaning they are planning wicked stuff it's not that oh something bad happened no they have been planning those wicked things for months years and so when our leaders are in position of um what's that what I'm looking for uh, when they are surrounded with people like that, there is a, a level of uh, ooh, um, the word just escaped me, literally. Um, influence that they are getting and we if we don't pray for them, for the Holy Spirit to influence their lives, they will be influenced by the wicked people around them in those meetings, even within the Seventh day Adventist Church. But let's keep on going. The third point there is more contentious. I put there if the GC supports future mandates over the consciences of members, that's an important caveat. If the GC in the future supports future mandates over the consciences of mandates, I think we are well within our rights to establish a parachurch movement within the Adventist Church. And what is that? A parachurch movement would be a gathering, a, a lay, lay, lay conference of lay, laity. They gather, they maybe incorporate, they return their tithes, that new lay entity that covers the whole of North American division. And then the committee allocates that tithe to conferences who are faithful to scripture. And that way, the conferences that go woke will go broke. Very simple. And the members will determine where that tithe goes based on fidelity to scripture and whether they are willing to contend for the faith that has been passed on to us. Now, <laughs> yeah, that, that was the, the strings that pull. No, that was the trigger that being pulled that got the bullet out. 
Uh, oh man. I know, and when it comes to the Seventh Day Adventist Church, the one thing you do not speak against. And you might be a Seventh Day Adventist and still, you know, having your church on Sunday, you might get nothing, like no bad reaction. But the moment you start talking about removing the tithe from the church, yes, because it's money. Yes. Remember, money talks. If he had never mentioned any of these parts, like power, power church, tithe and offering, I'm assuming it would have been a different reaction. But when you start saying removing your tithe, because we can, for sure, we can choose not to give tithe. But, this is not what God asks us to do. That's the thing. As much as I think what you just said is fair, but is it what God said to do? I'm not against him on that part to give your tithe to conferences where they uphold the Bible. I think it's a great idea. But my question was, what did God ask us to do? And I think that's a discussion that needs to be had. To be had. Because as I grew up, I always knew you give your tithe to your church and it goes to the conference, the conference, um, takes ten percent of that and distributes to the um to the union and then the union takes some takes percent of that and then no takes ten, the conference takes ten percent of that and then gives it to the division and the division takes ten percent of that and gives it to the union and the union takes ten percent and gives it to the G C and then that's how they distribute I think the way it is. I might be wrong but I don't know how it is. When you say you're going to remove your tithe, that means some pastors, educators will not get paid. And I'm going to put it that way. I was talking to someone. Um, and I said, sometimes the tithe is used to pay for you know, professors in universities, Avenues universities. And she said, well, the school's already getting a lot of money from the students. Why would my tithe be used to pay professors? I don't know the answer to that. That's maybe that's another discussion to have. But I do understand where he's coming from when it comes to take your tithe to other places. Therefore, your tithe can be used for God's arrangement, not for a woke, a wicked people to use. Let's keep on moving. I recognize this is a, when you touch the question of tithe, this is the, this is the, the sacred nerve in the Adventist church. But Elder Wilson did say in his... I just said that. I, hey, I know my people. I know my people. First sermon, hold your leaders to account. So we're going to hold our leaders to account. And if, if more mandates are imposed that override your conscience and the church throws us under the bus once again... I believe that someone somewhere will take the first steps to establish a parachurch movement. And we'll say, with modern banking and modern legal systems, we don't need the conference union division GC hierarchy. We can collect the tithes ourselves and allocate them to the conferences that are faithful to scripture. It's a revolutionary idea. It's kind of crossing the Rubicon from many administrators' perspective. But it's what we can do as members because we were encouraged to hold our leaders to account by our current GC president when he was elected. And this is about the only way we can do it. So this may well happen if the GC supports future mandates over the consciences of members. And the fourth thing, we're not there yet, is migrate to an underground house church movement led by bivocational elders and pastors. That's where we're gonna be when the mark of the beast is imposed. When the mark of the beast is imposed, the conferences cannot bank because they won't receive the mark of the beast if they're, if they're faithful to scripture. That means the conferences cannot employ pastors, they cannot employ teachers, they cannot receive tithes and offerings. Therefore, the conferences when the mark of the beast is imposed are basically history. So when the mark of the beast is imposed, we will be in 
underground house church movements led by bivocational elders who are elders and pastors of the same things in the New Testament. But we're not there yet in time. The mark of the beast is not here yet. We are stronger as a movement and more effective in reaching unreached when we work together. So therefore, I would appeal tonight, as I've appealed before to the church leaders, so that this annual council, this October, I know many of the church leaders will see this sermon. Many of you know that what happened was a profound mistake. So may the Holy Spirit give you the courage to rescind and apologize for the 2021 reaffirmation statement. It has been exposed to be a pack of lies. You took shelter in lies. Now you can stand for the truth. I want to appeal to our GC leaders to establish a fund to compensate Adventists who lost their livelihoods like that young man in Australia who suffered catastrophic physical damage from the vaccines they were forced to take because of the reaffirmation statement. That ain't gonna happen. Um, unfortunately, I, uh, I, as much as I would love to be optimistic, I have a strong feeling this is not gonna happen. There won't be any apology, which at this point, if, if now it has to happen, it would be nothing because the damage already been done. It's been already two or three years since that already stopped. There is no need for an apology right now because it would be fake. So that to me ain't gonna happen at all. It just adds insult to injury that that which was mandated in 22 was banned by the Australian government because of those problems. It's ridiculous. It's truly ridiculous. So I want, I'd like to appeal to the GC to publicly affirm that in the future they will defend the good conscience decisions of all Adventists vis-a-vis -vis any and all future vaccination mandates. If we do that, the whole world will hear about the Adventist Church because we'll be the only Protestant denomination that stands for liberty of conscience when the next set of mandates come out. And the book of Revelation and the three angels' messages, fear God and give glory to him, those messages are given in the context of, of the mandates of the mark of the beast because the third angel's messages do not receive the mark of the beast. So the three angel's messages presuppose that you and I and planet Earth, everybody still has in that final crisis at least some liberty of conscience to respond in faith to God, no matter what the beasts of this world might do to them. So therefore, if we want to be known as the church, the movement that champions liberty of conscience, we can start today by affirming that we will uphold the conscience of our members vis-a-vis -vis any future vaccination mandates. And finally, to rehire any Adventists who are fired by the denomination um, for living in accordance with the convictions of the Holy Spirit. And as I was thinking about this, I added another appeal. And this is, um, there's a lot of text on the screen there, but let me just share what I'm saying. The US federal government is turning its back on God. As you turn away from God, you turn to Satan and his control. So the US federal government is turning now to its end time role as a war making, persecuting, conscience denying second beast of Revelation 13. We can see the second beast coming into effect before our very eyes. Even as we speak this year, 2024, satanic policies are being imposed by the federal government. As an example, the new Title IX rules on gender identity are affecting all the colleges in America. Now, the Adventist church cannot be a prophetic voice that God has raised her to be while she is financially dependent on the second beast of Revelation 13. Therefore, if we are to be the prophetic voice at the end of time, I would appeal to the Wilson administration to add to the agenda of the 25 session the question of divesting all institutions that receive federal funding uh, from the STA church. <laughs> Sooner or later, as we heard in our Q&A today, Sooner or later, we have to get off that federal train. Sooner or later. If we don't get off that federal train, then the, the financial ties of that federal train will mean that our institutions will persecute our members when the mark of the beast is imposed. So we have been blessed over the years by our partnership with, with Medicaid and Medicare and, and all the rest of it. But that was when we had more of an ideologically benign government. We no longer have ideologically benign governments. We have ideologically driven federal governments. And sooner or later, this question has to come to the fore. The pandemic is a great catalyst for raising this question. Sooner or later, we have to get off that federal train or we're going to implement federal mandates all the way through to the mark of the beast.
I'm going to stop it right here because, <sighs> man, there's a lot of issues happening in the world today. And I'm can I can tell you most people, some people are not even they are clueless. And what he was mentioning is so important to know because the the day will come when I always said I never liked the idea that our church is federally funded. I didn't like it. What do you think? What do you think? Let me know in the comment section down below. I'm not going to continue because it is a it is a topic that needs to be uh, to have a conversation. And I am as I'm seeing it I don't think the GC will want to sit down with people like the regular members and have a conversation about how the church is going. And so I think this is for the members to start speaking out themselves and talk about where the church is going and how they are viewing the church at this time. I'm not asking anybody to leave the church because I don't think that's the best answer either. But you can be a Seventh-day Adventist without being I would say what a member of the church you you don't my thing is being in a body of Christ doesn't mean you have to be a seventh day Adventist and I think this is going to be where people are not going to be happy about what's going on so, some may not want to leave the church. And some may say, I'm leaving the Seventh Avenue Church. Where are you going? So I think in this case, um, what he said was being a Seventh Avenue Church, but having a power church will be the best, to my opinion, case scenario. But guys, um, I'm going to stop it right here. Don't forget again to hit that like button and scroll button below. It was the Open Field TV. I hope to see you guys again. Until then, bye for now.